morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to our Good Friday service at Ebenezer United Church. We are happy to have you with us today, whether you're in person or you're on Zoom. I want to say a, give a big thank you to all who are participating in the service today. This service this morning is based on the Stations of the Cross, a devotion that was developed in the Middle Ages by the Franciscans as a way of allowing people who could not travel to the Holy Land to walk where Christ walked on the day of his passion. By the end of the 17th century, many churches had stations or stops arranged at intervals along their walls, each with a cross, and under that cross, a representation of an event in the Passion narrative. Nine of the 14 stations are taken directly from scripture. The other five came out of the earliest traditions of the church. It is our prayer that you will relax and enter into the experience of Christ's passion, that you may know the meaning of what our Lord has done for us. Please stand as you're able for the call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God, who redeems us from sin and death. For us and for our salvation, Christ became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Remain standing for our hymn of praise when I survey the wondrous cross. Please be seated, and together we will say the invocation. 
O merciful God, you did not spare your only Son, but offered him up for us all, that he might bear our sins upon the cross. Grant that we might so examine ourselves and realize our own sinfulness that is so great as to spiritually crucify him anew. Help us to recognize those nails which we drive into his cross today and transform us into more faithful disciples in his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. And the confession will be done responsively. God of love and mercy, you sent Christ into the world so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Yeah. Our lives are often less than you would have them be. We do not trust the power of your love. We have filled the world with violence and terror because we cannot trust the way of compassion and service. In the face of uncertainty and trouble, we give up on you and one another. Forgive who we have been, amend who we are, and direct who we shall be in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, this is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. All we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its sharers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. To all who turn to the Lord then, he says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Thanks be to God. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. O God, our source of wisdom and understanding, in the midst of distractions around us, still our minds to listen. In the midst of competing voices, let us hear your word. Among the choices that confront us, Help us follow your will for the sake of Jesus, your Son and our Savior, your living word, in whose glorious and powerful name we pray. Amen. On this Good Friday morning, my friends, we visit this narrative of the Stations of the Cross. There are actually 14 stations, as you would have heard mentioned earlier on in the introduction. But today we focus on eight of those 14 stations. And we're going to invite persons to come and join and share in the readings as each section is about to finish. We will sing, or is finished, we will sing a portion of a hymn. And we invite the next set of readers to proceed to the lectern at that time. It is Friday, early in the morning, 
Jesus is brought from Cephas, the high priest, to Pontius Pilate, the governor, on trumped up charges of treason and is condemned to death. The cries of crucify him, crucify him, still ring in my ears. The picture of Pilate sitting on the judge's bench asking the crowd of leaders and people, shall I crucify your king? And their response, we have no king but the emperor, is an image that haunts me. It haunts me because of the callousness and injustice of it all. The world is often so unjust. But mostly it haunts me because I see this injustice, this callousness sometimes in myself. Lord, when do I see you hungry, sick and helpless, and do not reach out to you? Oh Lord Jesus, help us all to remember why you came to us and how we responded. Give us grace to reach out to you in love and justice. Were you there? <laughs> is thrust into Jesus' arms. He is ordered to carry it to the site of his execution. Jesus accepts the cross. Carrying it by himself, he goes out to the place of the skull, Golgotha, to be crucified with two other men. He went out carrying his cross. Humanity is burdened with many crosses, war, hunger, and famine, greed and poverty, sickness and death. My neighbors bear their crosses. Some there are who mourn, some who struggle to survive financially, some who are in fear and loneliness. Jesus went out carrying his cross alone. He knows what it's like to carry a heavy burden. The hymn, Take Up Your Cross, verse 3. Cyrene helps Jesus carry the cross. Jesus is faltering under the load. The soldiers feared that he might die along the way. They seized Simon Cyrene, put the cross on his shoulders too, as he stands behind Jesus and make him help shoulder the load. A perfect stranger coming into the city just happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was grabbed 
and forced to take the cross. Was he reluctant? Was I? I longed to help Jesus, but I was afraid. I was relieved when they did pick someone out of the crowd to help. I was ashamed that I could not bring myself to step out of character, out of my role to help the man. Thank you, God, for strangers in our midst who often unwittingly show us what to do and how to do it. Open our eyes and hearts and enlarge our vision. The hymn, Take Up Your Cross, verse 1. Station 4, Jesus is stripped of his garments. Finally, they arrived at the God-forsaken place where he will be crucified. People dumped their garbage here. Hurriedly, roughly, his clothes were stripped from his back, leaving him naked in front of the crowd. Naked, exhausted, and humiliated. Strip naked. Nothing left, not even dignity. Is this his poverty or is it ours? We t took his clothes, we took his dignity. Much like the world strips naked hundreds and thousands of people every day with its greed and uncaring. Our selfishness stands exposed for what it is when we stripped Jesus naked. Dear Lord, we reach out and grasp greedily for so much searching for what will satisfy. We do not know how to let go of things and let you in. Help us to choose what will bring healing and wholeness. The hymn, My Song is Love Unknown, verses one and two. Station 5. Jesus is nailed to the cross. Roughly, contemptuously, the soldiers thrust Jesus down onto his cross. Holding him down, some sit on him. They pound the nails through his hands and feet. After he is lifted up, the soldiers throw dyes for his clothing to fulfill the scripture. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. The ring of the hammer on the nails, the sickening sound of flesh and bone, 
crushing echo in my brain. I'll never, never either ever forget this. Somehow, this one crucifixion is different than all the others. I've been to. The torture, for that was what it was, has not stopped. It still happens every day, from utter brutality to the unkind words that flay the soul. It still happens. But the nonchalance, the ease with which the soldiers threw the dice beneath his feet, as if nothing were happening, horrifies me today. I know. I was there. I threw the dice with the rest. O oh God, our God, we have forsaken thee, fled from the crosses you asked us to bear, turned to endless games and sport to numb our pain. That day you did not flee. Help us to turn to you, to embrace you and the yoke you have offered us. The hymn, O oh, come and mourn with me a while, verses 1 and 2. Station 6, Jesus Dies on the Cross. The nightmare of pain and suffering, the agony of betrayal and loneliness come to an end. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing <coughs> beside her, and he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. The thief on the cross beside him cries out, Remember me, O Lord, when you come to your kingdom. After three mercifully brief hours on the cross, suspended between earth and sky, Jesus dies. Choking on the hyssop dipped in the wine, he gasps out the words, It is finished. He bows his head and gives up his spirit. I watched. I heard the words he spoke. I saw his agony. I felt the spear dig in his flesh. I saw the blood and water pour out down his side, down the side, his thighs to the ground. Violence and death. I hung my head. I could no longer see for the tears that flowed like, the, like his blood down my face. I could not stop the words. Truly, this man was God's son. I felt overcome. Why did I have a hand in this? How, ha how have I let it happen? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a cluster, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. 
the him they crucified my lord Station 7. Jesus is taken down from the cross. He is dead. His body hangs limply, heavily. The darkness which had filled the sky since noon begins to fade. A wild rumor that the curtain of the temple had been torn in two from top to bottom was circulating. The soldiers yank out the nails to get him down. Everyone, including the women who had followed him and were looking on from a distance, stand back awkwardly and watch the scene before them. Bleeding, broken, limp, and heavy in his death, they place him in the arms of his mother. How did she feel? How did she feel? Mary, the mother of Jesus, how did she feel? With infinite tenderness, she gently held him and wiped his blooded brow as her tears fell on his lifeless body. How did she feel? She shoes away the hands that would have parted her from her son. Just one more moment, she whispers, how did she feel? I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. The hymn, Rock of Ages, verse 1.
station eight, the burial of Jesus. Relatives and friends carry his body to the gravesite, to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who was also a disciple of Jesus. They lay his body gently in the new tomb carved out of the hill, wrapped in a clean linen cloth. They roll a boulder across the entrance and silently withdraw. The place of the tomb was in a garden. This garden seemed strangely silent and still as I stole into it to watch them. My mind and my body were in shock. Images registered on my brain, but I felt nothing. It was over. The crucifixion was over. This Jesus had died, but my life would never be the same. He was gone gone and I did not know him. I went away and wept bitterly. God did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, one another. Just, just as, as I, I have loved you, you, you also should love one, one another. By this, this everyone will know you are my disciples. disciples. The hymn, Were You There? Verse 5. I wish to invite you at this time to enter into a moment of silent meditation, after which I will say a few words on what this Good Friday means for you and for me and for the rest of the world. But let us spend three minutes in a time of quiet meditation and contemplation as we hear the story again told through the stations of the cross.
Amen. In the scripture, the number three represents or signifies suffering. So Jesus was on the cross, it is said, for three hours. It is believed that he died at three o'clock. He was laid in the tomb and he rose on the third day. As today we are brought into the suffering of Christ for a cruel, careless, carefree, and reckless world. A world that is indifferent to the gift of God. We see ourselves in Christ, called to walk this way of the cross. A few weeks ago, we talked about the way of the cross, and that was part one. This morning, I wish to go into part two of that way. And though Jesus was on the cross dying for the world, the story tells us that there were those beneath the cross who mocked him. But it was so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. They cast lots over my garments. There was the one thief on the cross who said, you saved others. Why not save yourselves and save us? There were voices coming from everywhere mocking him as the king of the Jews. As a matter of fact, Pilate ensured to cement that mockery. They gave him a crown of thorns and they put a sign above his head on the cross, Jesus, king of the Jews. My reflections today draw inspiration from sources such as Kaufman commentaries, Don Schweger, and most importantly, the Bible or the Holy Scriptures. As we contemplate the way of the cross, part two, we're taken to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 38 to 40. And there we contemplate the way of pride. And the Gospel of Mark is the most practical of all the Gospels. In chapter 12, Mark attempts to answer some searching questions about the appropriate response to the grace of God in Jesus Christ demonstrated through his teachings and works. In verses 38 through 40, Mark captures Jesus dealing another blow to the status quo religion as practiced by the Pharisees, who were the accepted authority on religion, the religion of the day. The Pharisees were well known for their pomp and their pageantry, and Jesus seized every opportunity to highlight this type of disposition and to expose it for what it truly was. Yet another time we find our Lord denouncing the Pharisaic posture. 
Is it not strange that when we read the Bible, and in particular, any text about the Pharisees, how we love to castigate and to criticize them? Yet, yet Jesus would ask of us today, have you distinguished yourself from those upon whom you cast judgment? Let us look briefly at what Jesus has to say about these Pharisees who represent that which is undesirable about religion. Jesus warned his disciples not to be fooled by the Pharisees whose only interest is a display of self-righteousness. Their excessively long and stylish robe was a mark of distinction which they loved, but it only served to cover up or distract from their sins. They loved to be greeted in the marketplace and whenever or where, wherever they went, they desired to sit in the high places or the best seats. All of these acts demonstrating a pathology of vain conceit, aggrandizement, and self-elevation. The psychological profile of the Pharisees could be read as thus, acute inferiority complex, delusions of grandeur, narcissistic, and inflamed with love for self, and an inordinate fascination with self to the point of self-absorption, Anyone so in love with self sees none other but self. But Jesus went a step further to suggest that if they were so religious, why do they take advantage of the widows by charging such weak persons excessive fees and taking advantage of their hospitality? Therefore, Jesus warns us as he did his disciples against three things. One, the desire for prominence rather than selfless service. Two, the desire for admiration and recognition rather than seeking to promote the good of others through humble service and love. And three, attempting to use one's status for self-gain and self-advancement. The religion that God calls us to is one of humble service in holiness and righteousness before God and our fellow humans that elevates the best interest of God and others over the interests of self and this in love, honor, and reverence. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, says the writer of Proverbs in chapter 16. And verse 5. But not only do we find along the way of the cross the way of pride, we also find the way of envy. Who doesn't want to be first and to be esteemed and honored by others? Humans seem to have an unquenchable thirst for recognition and fame power and authority to rule our own lives as we please, as well as the lives of others. Should we be surprised to see the disciples of Jesus thirsting for power, thirsting for position, thirsting for authority? This is what we hear in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 20 through to 28. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, urged their mother to strike a deal with Jesus. They wanted the distinction of being first and most important in position, next to Jesus, of course. When Jesus called the twelve disciples or apostles to be his inner circle of disciples who would teach and exercise spiritual authority on his behalf, he did the unthinkable. Jesus taught 
contrary to the world's understanding of power, authority, and position. By reversing the order of master and servant, lord and subject, first and last. He never went into the wonderful neighborhoods to find the sons of those prominent persons. Those who were most educated, those who were most esteemed. Rather, he went for the most lowly those who were not seen or recognized in the community. He went for fishermen. He went for tax collectors. He went for those who would otherwise not be liked. And Jesus wedded authority with love, position with sacrifice, and service with humility. There can be no authority without love. There can be no position without sacrifice. There can be no service without humility, at least not in the kingdom of God. Position without respect and concern for the subordinate is demeaning and rude. And service without generosity and sacrifice, is cheap and unkind. And authority without love is overbearing and slavish. Those who wish to serve with the Lord Jesus and to exercise authority in God's kingdom must be prepared to sacrifice. Not just some of their time, talents, money, and other resources, but their whole lives and all that they possess. Jesus used stark language to explain what kind of sacrifice he had in mind. His disciples must drink of his cup if they expect to reign with him in his kingdom. The cup he had in mind was a bitter one involving crucifixion. What kind of cup does the Lord have in mind for us? For some disciples, such a cup entails physical suffering. For others, the painful struggle of martyrdom. Yet still for many, it entails or contains the long routine of the Christian life with all its daily sacrifices, disappointments, setbacks, struggles, and temptation. This was what the cross of Christ represented then, and it is what the cross of Christ represents now. A disciple of Jesus must be ready to lay down his or her life each and every day in the little and big sacrifices required and even to the point of giving up everything for the sake of the gospel of Christ. What makes such a sacrifice a joy rather than a burden? It is love. The kind of love which God has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us, according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. An early church father summed up Jesus' teaching with the expression, to serve is to reign with Christ. We share in God's reign by laying down our lives in humble service and love for one another, just as Jesus did for our sake. Are we ready to lay down our lives, to take up the cross, and to follow Jesus by serving others as Jesus served and has taught and modeled for us to do? Jesus very clearly implies that at least one criterion for those who, for, for these special seats 
that so many desire in the kingdom. These special positions that so many enjoy is suffering. You do not know what you are asking, he said, after James and John posed the proposition to him. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? For whom are these special seats prepared? Perhaps for those whom God has appointed to share most fully in the sufferings of Christ, according to the mysterious purposes of his own sovereign will. Notice Jesus never says there will only be one seat at his right hand and only one seat at his left hand for a total of only two seats. There is no reason to think that Jesus was concerned to correct every simple or single faulty assumption. For the way of the Christ, the way of the cross rather, is not marked with envy. And finally, my friends, the way of the cross consists in betrayal. Do you know the pain of rejection? The greatest pain and injury come not from our enemies, but from those closest to us. Psalm 55 foretells the suffering of rejection which God's anointed King and Messiah would endure for our sake. It is not an enemy who taunts me, the writer of the psalm says, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to hold sweet conversations together. Within God's house, we walked in fellowship. Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14. In the ancient world, a kiss was a sign of intimate friendship and trust. Judas' betrayal of Jesus, as we would find in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verses 47 to 56, with a kiss shows the hypocrisy of his love and trust. This is literally a kiss of death, not only because it leads to Jesus' death, but is also a sign of the death of one who lost all hope and abandoned God. In betraying Jesus, Judas rejected the one and only hope for freedom from sin and condemnation and the hope of reconciliation and restoration to friendship with God. But Jesus met rejection not with bitterness or resentment, but with love, compassion, and pity. God will never stop loving us no matter how far we stray from him or abandon him and our hope. When we encounter injury and rejection from others, how do we respond? Well, I can tell you what's usually the first human response that comes up in me. I want to put my hand around the neck of such a person and squeeze until there is no strength left in my body. How many of us feel like that sometimes? Feel the need to pay back. How many of us feel that we must return to evil with evil? Or as the scripture says, repay evil with evil. Wasn't it Jesus who said that we should turn the other cheek and for those of us who would think that that was not a literal suggestion i have bad news it actually was 
for the custom in the time of Jesus was that the one that was greater than the one that was considered lower could at any time be embarrassed by the one that was greater. So it was a difficult thing for the one that was greater to be called upon to strike the one that was lesser. There are quite a bit of other things in that story that I won't unpack for you today. But sufficing to say that it would have been embarrassing that the one that was greater would then have need to use the back of his hand or her hand to strike the one that was lesser. For the turn the other cheek meant that such a person would have to use the back of the hand, which was a debasing and a derogatory act towards the person who was already lesser. So Jesus was essentially saying that if you turn the other cheek, you force the other person to embarrass himself or herself if he or she feels that he or she needs to continue in this act against you. Do we respond with merciful love and a forgiving heart or with bitterness and revenge. I like to bring it home because I don't think that anywhere else is the human character brought out than in marriage. Do I have an amen? Oh, how we love our spouse or our spouses. And oh, how we love to hate our spouses. And by hate, I don't mean literal hate. But you know, sometimes we say, I don't like you today. I, I really don't like you today. How do we respond? Do we respond all the time with merciful love? when we are hurt or injured, because usually when we are hurt, we are hurt by those we care about. It is hard for us to get hurt by those we don't care about. We are already indifferent to them. But those who we care about, it is easy for them to hurt us. How do we respond? With forgiveness? With revenge? I will pay you back? Jesus met his betrayal and arrest with serenity and with confident trust in his father. He knew that this was Satan's hour of darkness, but God's light and truth would prevail in the end. How did the other apostles meet this trial? They were unprepared even though Jesus warned them about his betrayal. And they had forgotten God for the moment. Their will was to resist force with force rather than peaceably submit to God's will. And Jesus never failed to show mercy and compassion even to his enemies. And Luke tells us that Jesus touched the severed air and healed the high priest slave who had been struck by one of Jesus' own disciples. Peter, Luke 22, verse 51. When adversity strikes, how do we respond? With fear and panic or with confident hope and trust in God? It is guaranteed that if we respond according to the latter, it will reap for us destruction. For no good can come from a reaction of fear and panic and anxiety. But when we trust and confidently hope, we know that God is in control and everything will be well. That is why Jesus could have said on the cross, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It is finished.
the evil one can hurt me no more. And neither can the evil one hurt the world anymore. For the way of pride is gone. The way of envy is gone. The way of betrayal is gone. I have dealt with them all. I have finished the mission. I have completed your work. This, my friends, is the way of the cross. Amen. It brings us then to our closing hymn, my most favorite hymn of all times. And every time during Easter, I cannot resist this hymn. Not only during Easter, but throughout my life, I cannot resist this hymn. Jesus, keep me near the cross. May I invite you to rise and sing this hymn with me as we reflect on the stations of the cross, on the way of the cross. May Jesus keep us near the cross.
receive the benediction. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Go with God, my friends. Amen.